笑了。Welcome back to the Doctor's Companion Presents Doctor Who The Long Way Around, the weekly podcast where we review and discuss every episode of Doctor Who, one doctor at a time. I'm Scott Corelli. I'm Cassandra Fredrickson. I'm Nick Jimenez. And joining us once again, Jeff, welcome back. Uh, hello again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we are back to finish off our discussion of the Mind of Evil, the third Doctor's sixth story. But before we get to that... Uh, Jeff, why don't you tell our listeners what your background with Doctor Who is um, and uh, what your what your uh, sort of Doctor Who watching habits are? OK. <laughs> uh, wow. OK, so uh, it all started when I was 11 years old. Um, I was sick one evening at about midnight. And for whatever reason, PBS uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, decided to play Doctor Who episodes uh, in the mid-90s at midnight on Saturday nights. And so I was sick on the couch, and uh, and uh, my mom turned on the TV uh, and wanted something that would probably be age-appropriate, so she trusted PBS for that. Uh, and uh, on TV was uh, uh, Mordred Undead, um, which is a fifth Doctor story, one of the weirdest ones that you can get. <laughs> And uh, there was uh, first thing that I saw was a series of people walking around with what looked like cabbages uh, sort of taped to their head. Um, and I thought, <laughs> what is this? Because the production values just seem so shoddy. Um, but it was so weird, too. So unique. Um, and at the time, I was starting to get into storytelling myself. And, uh, you know, as an 11 year old, you don't have a lot of resources. Uh, and so uh I just really appreciated or something that spoke to me just as a kid was the fact that uh, they kept telling these stories um, or really wanted to tell this story. And it didn't really matter that, oh, you can see the strings on this spaceship uh, or whatever else. They were doing it with a budget, but the sort of the story was more important, or at least the idea of imagination was more important uh, than that. And so I got hooked um, and I watched it uh, pretty regularly or I taped it. Um, every single week until I was about 17 when they took it off the air. Um, and it was interesting because I watched the doctors uh, in an, a little bit of an unconventional order. I started sort of midway through the fifth doctor. And so he was my first doctor and I watched uh, five, six, seven, and then they started over with three. Um, they didn't have any of uh, Hartnell or, or uh, Troughton. Um, so five, six, seven, three, four. And I ended uh, with, I think Legopolis was the last episode I saw uh, when I was about 16 or 17 years old. Um, yeah, so it was a big part of my formative years. And then post-college, um, I knew that Doctor Who had been rebooted, that it was out there, um, but I didn't think much of it. And I uh, had a friend who said, hey, you should really sit down and watch this. And I did. And uh, yeah, nothing's <laughs> really been the same since then. Just got right back <laughs> into it. Um and so, yeah, in, uh, for a while I lived in Florida and I had a very boring job. Um, and so I took that opportunity of being bored to just, uh, obsess over Dr. Who and, uh, learn any little random fact that I could. Uh, and the internet existed now, which was crazy because when I first watched Dr. Who, when Peter Davison dies and turns into Colin Baker, I was like, what the heck is going on? Uh, I had no context <laughs> for anything. I thought it was going to be like a soap opera where sometimes they would say, you know, the role of the doctor this week is being played by. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that whole concept of regeneration and, and everything was crazy. Uh, but yeah, so now we live in the the age of the internet and I was able to look everything up uh, a few years ago and just got really obsessed. And so then I started collecting uh, all of the episodes, including uh, Reconstructions, 
uh, of the missing episodes. And I started this habit about, uh, this is probably about ooh, seven years ago, six years ago, of watching Doctor Who in order from an unearthly child all the way through current. Um, my God. Like <laughs> over and over. So I'm on my third run through and I just hit uh, the second season, David Tennant's season uh, of this. I've done this. This is my third run through of that. And I will typically not watch an entire episode in one sitting. I will occasionally, but usually I watch them, uh, you know, on my lunch break for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I actually have three iPods with all of the uh, doc with all of Doctor Who on the iPods. And uh, I used to like watch them when I'd like stand in line at the bank or, you know, things like that. Like, oh, five minutes here and there. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's a little bit about my obsession there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's 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 great. I mean, that's why uh, that's why I invited you on, because I knew uh, you would be a good resource. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I really appreciate just how the show has. I mean, beyond all the sort of fan service that it does now with either subtle or really overt references to things, um, I feel like the ethos of the show has become a little bit more distilled in New Who. Uh, and maybe that's mm -hmm. just because of the, you know, change in the way that, you know, we make television and tell stories and production and things like that. Uh, but you know, that, that commitment to, you know, imagination is still there, but I still, I love that idea, you know, that you can find in classic who and in new who, you know, of, uh, uh the, the, uh, encouragement to wonder at the universe. And because of that, to, to hope, I think it's super powerful and super enriching. And that's why I, uh, I like it. And, you know, it's cheap sci-fi is just good, you know? So it's a little bit of junk food, with some vitamins thrown in there, I feel like it's just it's great. <laughs> it's like when you uh, roll uh, medicine in a in a in a piece of cheese. Yeah, and give it to ex your dog. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, like the doctor does with Jamie. <laughs> right, like <laughs> That's the it, like does the doctor with does with Jamie. Jamie. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, let's get back into the mind of evil. The mind of evil, part four. Written by Don Houghton. Directed by Timothy Cohn. Produced by Barry Letts. Script edited by Terrence Dix. Air date 20th of February, 1971. The prison is in chaos as the machine affects everyone inside, even the master, who goes in and shuts it down. He checks on the doctor and finds that only one of his hearts is beating, so he struggles to kickstart the doctor's other heart and save him. When the doctor awakens, he informs the master that no one can control the machine because it isn't a machine at all. It's a creature that feeds on the evil of the mind. The master dismisses his claim and sends the doctor to the cell where he is keeping Joe, but tests the doctor's theory anyway by turning on the machine in an effort to prove that he cannot be overcome. The master is quickly overpowered by the machine and cowers before his greatest fear, the doctor laughing at him. He manages to escape the room, locking the machine inside and threatening to starve it of evil minds until it obeys him. Mailer confronts the master about why they haven't escaped the prison yet, but the master explains that he has a plan to get them a full pardon. They will hijack the missile in transit, and the master will use it to threaten the peace conference. The prisoners ambush the caravan, carrying the missile, and take off with it, but they're followed by Yates, who watches them unload the missile into a warehouse before being caught and taken captive. Meanwhile, Joe and the doctor overcome their guards and escape their cell, but rather than leave the prison, the doctor wants to lay low and wait for an opportunity to deal with the machine. Once they make it into the processing room, the machine disappears and begins to teleport around the prison, feeding on the evil of various prisoners and killing them. Mailer and another prisoner find the Doctor and Joe and hold them at gunpoint, but the machine appears directly behind them, killing the prisoner and forcing Mailer to flee. It disappears again, only to reappear in front of Joe and the Doctor. So episode four uh, starts with actually the Master coming in to save the Doctor from his Dalek hallucinations. <laughs> We've all been there. Yeah, so he comes, he, he comes to save the Doctor and... Um, he uh like one of his one of his hearts is down, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like his yes. his heart stops working. Only one heart. And yeah, and so the master like has to like revive him. And it's it's sort of um like this is the kind of the first moment 
in the doctor and the master's relationship where you realize that there is obviously sort of an emotional history there between the two of them that like the master would care enough to revive the doctor and not just be like, ha, Oh, good. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. It was, ter- it was terrific. Yeah. It's, it's sort of that first moment. Um, I think in the whole show yes, where you realize that they, they, they do care about each other weirdly. <laughs> it's not just the master's plan going wrong. You know, that's, he's not just like, Oh, I need this guy. I gotta, I gotta revive him. Like he's clearly a little bit panicked that his friend, uh, that this person is dying in front of him. Yeah. It was the first time that since I've, we've started, yeah, where, where you, you get that kind of mad love, the shared madness between the two of them, like, Oh, I hate him, but I, you know, I have to be, you know, like mm-hmm. the wind that would makes it, I believe up there with, with rivalries like Moriarty or Sherlock Holmes or the doctor, the, you know, the Joker and Batman and all that. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's why I like, uh, Delgado's master. I think the best is, is because they, uh, because off camera, uh, he and Pert, we had that relationship. They were, they were BFFs. And so, uh, the, 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 fact that they were playing enemies it you still kind of read their friendship chemistry between the two of them and uh he just you know they just sort of embraced it and it made the master and the doctor's relationship really complex and this is the first hint of that and it's great i love it um and it's something that we still deal with today i mean you know it it the master, the the you know Missy's Missy the master. Um, I always just want to call her the master, but I know no one will know what I'm talking about. Uh, so the Missy, um, Missy and uh, and 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 uh, and twelve. I mean, you know, their relationship was very similar to uh, to three and Delgado's master, and that's why I liked that relationship so much. I think. Yeah, my one of my favorite things about the master and the doctor's relationship is when they're forced to work together for like the greater good, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. And that happens in this. And I, I like them as antagonistic towards each other, but I like them having to be like reluctant. I don't know, like roommates or something like, (laughs) (laughs) like we got paired up for this class project and now we have to work together, I guess. Um, Yeah. Well, that's the best. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. So then um, basically the doctor figures out that uh, the master isn't uh, smart enough to build this uh, this machine um, and that there's a living creature inside of it um, that is feeding on evil. Uh, and so this uh, machine, th- this thing we thought was a machine is actually like – Basically, like a like a little Dalek that feeds on evil. Um, I mean, it's not a Dalek, <laughs> but I mean that's kind of what it is. I mean, yeah. Later, they they crack open the thing, and it just it looks like a it looks like a like a Jello mold of organs. Um, it's, it's pretty gross. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, so they they figure this out, and so the master uh, basically says. Um, you know, oh, whatever. I'll be able to. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna prove that I can overcome this thing. I'm the master of this machine. And then he goes in there and by himself <laughs> and tries to overcome the machine. And it it feeds on his evil. And he just sees apparently what the master fears more than anything <laughs> is to be laughed at by the doctor. <laughs> oh my god, I love that so love much. It. It's so good. It was amazing. <laughs> that is one of my all time favorite images. Maybe not just of classic Who, but of all of Doctor Who is that image of the superimposed giant doctor laughing at a cowering master. <laughs> it's just spectacular. Because you just know it has nothing to do with like stopping his evil plan yeah. in his head. It's like a very personal, yeah. like, you look yeah. stupid right now. He doesn't respect him. He's afraid that he's not respected by the doctor. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Um, so, uh Yeah. So that's great. Master realizes he can't overcome it. So instead, he's going to starve the stupid thing into submission. So he's like, I'm going to lock you in this room. You're not going to get any evil for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Have <laughs> that. And then he just he just leaves. Uh, and then uh, and so the master's like, all right. So um, 
my uh, uh, the he basically has this plan. He goes and talks to uh, Mailer, and he's like, "Look, we're gonna get a free pardon because we're going to. Uh, I'm gonna start World War Three, and then all it's gonna be forgiven. That's my plan. That's gonna work out great for all of us." <laughs> uh, and Mailer is like, "All right. I mean, you seem to know what you're talking about." Uh, so. So uh, that's that's their plan. Um, meanwhile, Joe and uh, and the doctor are in a cell, and Joe asks for food, and uh, she she uh, smacks the tray of food uh, into the face of the prisoner, and then and then karate chops him on the back of the neck. Yeah, and then the doctor snaps up and grabs a tray and smacks the other guard in the face when he comes through the door. It was uh, it, they 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 had a whole system ready to go. Um, to take these people down. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I like, I like uh, these. No one, no one escapes a jail cell better than uh, John Pertwee, I think. Um, but because uh, he he's put in a lot of them in the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so the 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 masters um, basically uh, tells the prisoners like. There's going to be a missile convoy. They're 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 moving this missile from here to here. They're going to drive right past the prison. So you just need to go out to here, meet them, steal the missile, and uh, and then we can start World War Three, and and then we'll get a free pardon. And uh, so they go and they they steal the missile, and uh, Yates gets captured. First, he gets taken out by a gun. I don't think he's technically shot. I think he's just. <laughs> Like knocked to the ground with a bullet. I don't know. It's weird. Um, <laughs> it's very the, it. All of the gun fighting and and fighting in this has a very like fourth grade fourth graders yes. playing in a backyard logic. <laughs> yes. 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 Oh, absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, so Yates sort of like gets away at first, and then crawls over to the base, and then gets caught at the base uh, and captured. Um, but then, meanwhile. Uh, the machine, which is being starved in, uh, is is grounded in the room by the master and is getting starved. Um, it uh, gets hungry enough that it learns how to move. In which point, I put Stop in leaving. my notes, I put in my notes, clever girl. Oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So the machine can move. It's like a teleporting Dalek, which is way more terrifying than a regular Dalek, Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. The Mind of Evil, Part 5. Written by Don Houghton. Directed by Timothy Combe. Produced by Barry Letts. Script edited by Terrence Dix. Air date, 27th of February, 1971. The machine disappears, choosing to follow Mailer instead of attacking the Doctor and Joe. They find Barnum and leave together. The Brigadier flies a helicopter over the area, looking for the stolen missile, and Joe tries to get his attention, but they are quickly surrounded by prisoners instead. They are taken to Mailer, who is looking for a better deal than the Master's offer, but when the Doctor doesn't have one, he sends them back to their cell. The Master asks for the Doctor's help to control the machine. The Doctor refuses at first, but eventually relents, creating a coil that can mimic the human brain and hold it in place. But he warns the master that it won't work for long, but the master ignores him and returns the doctor to his cell. Convinced that the stolen missile is somewhere near the prison, the brigadier concocts a plan that will use a secret passage and a Trojan horse to gain entry to the prison and overtake it. They take a delivery van to the prison where the brigadier, disguised as a workman, convinces a guard to let him drive the van into the prison and make a delivery. Once inside, unit agents, hidden inside the van, quickly ambush and overcome the prison, claiming it for military control, as the brigadier makes his way inside to look for the doctor. Not wanting to be caught, Mailer takes the doctor and Joe at gunpoint, demanding that they come with him as hostages, and so that he can use them as human shields to escape. Joe fights back, but Mailer pulls out his gun, aims it at the doctor, and fires. Episode 5, the machine, like, follows... um, So, like, okay, so the machine was, like, moving all around in the last episode, get taken out people left and right. And uh, and then when it it has... uh, the doctor and Joe and Mailer cornered. Mailer makes a run for it, and then it follows him because he's like way more evil. He's he's much more of a snack yes. than <laughs> than the doctor and Joe. And so the doctor's like, "Oh yeah, he's there. It's attracted to his evilness. We're 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 all right. 
we're like normal amounts of evil. And Jill's like, all right, <laughs> sure. Um, so, <laughs> what, whatever works. Yeah. Uh, this episode also features Brig in a helicopter as he, yes. as he looks for the missile, mm-hmm. um, which I love. It's, it's actually one of the sequences that caused this story to go way over budget. Yeah. Uh, so that the director never uh, worked again on yeah. Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> oh, no. He was... Yeah, he was a he was a bad Doctor Who director. He he made them go over budget, which is like the one thing you don't do in Doctor Who. Apparently. Look at the lengths they go to not go over budget on this. Show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um so uh uh um Mailer basically uh he kind of he like kind of double crosses the master he basically says like you need to get here and figure out this machine thing that's trying to kill me uh because otherwise i'm going to tell everybody your evil plan to start world war three and uh, the master's like all right i'm coming <laughs> jerk um <laughs> and uh i i just um you shouldn't have told your evil plan to a criminal I know, right? Like, why was he being so transparent? I don't know. I don't know. Ego. He's weird. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, so uh, the brigadier is like, all right, the brigadier is convinced because he can't find the missile uh, in the helicopter. He's convinced that it's somewhere in the prison since it used to be a fortress. And uh, I just, he, his plan is to use the secret passage that the prison just so happens to have. Um, which he says hasn't been blocked off yet. And I'm just like, it's a prison. Why wouldn't a secret passage be blocked <laughs> off? There were tons. The Paddington 2 jail had tons of secret passages. Yeah, that's true. Was... I guess that, all right, that's fair. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. And so his, his, uh, his plan is that they're going to Trojan horse the prison, uh, with him and his boys. And, uh, so they're going to, they're going to show up. In a van uh, full of what what they think are food supplies, but will actually be a van full of soldiers, and they're going to take this prison to the ground. So that's their plan. Um, meanwhile, uh, Joe and Doctor playing checkers, and yes. uh, Joe wins. <laughs> Such an amazing scene right there! I love it. There's a there little it. bit of drama before, like just to show up the master, and he's like, "All right, I've allowed you your little gesture." <laughs> So good. <laughs> also, uh, the doctor like mentions uh, he's like he's like well this is just far too easy. That's why I I failed. <laughs> that's why I lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's why I lost. It's it's too easy of a game. Uh, and I I'm used to three d three dimensional chess. Which isn't that a Star Trek thing? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, st- yeah. So, I mean, Star Trek popularized it, but it existed. I think it was invented in like I don't know early 1900s or something like that. Oh, uh, Star Trek so, just made Star Trek just made it cool, Scott. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I was I was just hoping that the Doctor was like a big Star Trek fan. Oh man, just, like, just go I, to like I Trekkie think that should be Just forget, or, or edit out what I just said, and then that was <laughs> I just I just like the idea of the Doctor going to like Trekkie conventions and like playing three D <laughs> chess, like yeah the other trick oh god you know Although he speaks n- fluent klingon nine was oh, really yeah. <laughs> upset about being called spock and mr spock so i don't know mm. maybe three really was a big star trek fan yeah <laughs> yeah i mean three has a lot in common with kirk let's be honest hey, that's mm-hmm. true <laughs> the, the so. karate yeah yeah it's true um so uh, basically the master is like all right i need your help we got to figure out this machine thing. It's out of control. It's moving around. Uh, these guys are scared. I'm scared. <laughs> you need to help me out. And we need to figure this out. And uh, the doctor's like, all right, give me a lab coat and uh, let's, let's do this. <laughs> let's do science. <laughs> yeah, let's do science. So the doctor comes up with this idea of like basically like a, like a lasso. Like he's going to drop a lasso around yes. this thing and it, it's going to like depower it. Um, <laughs> And, uh, it's, I just, this, I mean, this is like the next scene of just like the doctor and master being BFFs Mm -hmm. and it's, it seems like this where I really would love, uh, just a whole season where the doctor's companion is the master. Oh man. (laughs) Yeah. 
I just it would be so good. They were gonna um, they were gonna do that with uh, before um, Russell T Davies took over the animation uh, Scream of Shalka or whatever they had. Uh, which was supposedly going to be the continuation of Doctor Who. It was going to continue as a Flash series, uh, web series. Um, right. They had, Richard Grant. Yeah, they had Richard Grant as the Doctor, and his companion was a, if not the exact Delgado Master, a strikingly similar Delgado Master that was actually an android. Uh, but, oh, I, I mean, I, I would love to see, at least I would love to see three in Delgado uh team up just on the road you know doctor and companion Ugh. that would be the best i <laughs> love that um so uh so yeah so he he puts together this uh this coil trap and gets the uh gets the machine uh stupefied with this <laughs> this thing that he comes up with and this is when he's as he's getting closer to the machine he's getting like more and more shots of like Daleks and Cybermen and all of the things. Um, right. Let me see if I have the full list here. I've got the full list. Uh, it is a Dalek, a uh, k- <laughs> the the thing from the rescue, the Kaquillan. Kaquillan. Oh man, I love him. Wow. Yeah, that's the a real deep cut. <laughs> yeah the the Ice Lord Slar from yes. Seeds of Death, uh, a Zarbi from the Web Planet, a War Machine, uh, a Silurian. An ice warrior, a Cyberman, um, and then uh, I guess apparently they they thought about using uh, the Slither from Dalek Invasion of Earth. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, wow, and uh, the Servo ro- Robot from Wheel in Space and a Sensorite, but then they they chose not to use those because it My was just too God. many too many things. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's seeing all these visions of all these villains that he. Uh, he he did away with at one point. None of them are another. the master. Right, none of them are the master. Because <laughs> as we've learned, he doesn't respect the master, <laughs> which is the master's greatest fear. Um, it's complicated. And, uh, yeah. So so anyway, so uh, so he gets he gets the machine uh, to chill out, and the master's like, "Okay, great. Uh, now back to yourself." Um, which. I love I love the doctor's expression of like oh come on that's like, yeah that switch is so good because the doctor comes out feeling good and it's clear like hey man we just did that I'm feeling so cool and then the the prisoner with the gun pops in the screen and the master's like great now it's on with my plan it ruins <laughs> the moment he ruins the moment that's why he doesn't respect you man yeah no kidding so he takes him back to the cell and we get that great bit where. The the doctor's like real sad and uh and Joe's like, Oh, but I, I found this food on the floor and I've got this water. <laughs> uh and he's like, No, that's not I mean, all right, I'll take some. And so then they he's like they're just like munching on this food she found on the floor. And he's just like, Did I ever tell you the story of when I was in the Tower of London? And then he just starts he's just he's just chewing on on, on food and just like telling her this story and then we just Fade away. I'm so sad toast. it cuts away because yeah. I want the rest of that story so bad. <laughs> I know. Also, like, I'm kind of upset that I hadn't tracked this before we started, now that we're on, like, our sixth go-around. But I am fairly certain that Pertwee eats something in every single story oh, that he's fascinating. in. Fascinating. And I want to figure out, like, if that's accurate. I, because I feel I'm like he's sure. always eating yeah, I'm pretty sure that's actually a thing. Um, like uh, like Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt also has that thing yeah. where it's like in his contract that every project he works on, he gets to eat because he likes the way he looks when he's eating and acting. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Tom Tom Cruise has to run in everything because he likes the way he looks when he runs. And be 31 years old. Oh, Right. He has to be 31 years old. Uh, but... <laughs> A, a char- every a, one character in every con- Tom Cruise movie has to remark upon his youth. You young yeah. rap, you young rebel. You. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised because I think I think you're right. I think I've heard that before that John Pertwee wanted to have a scene where he was eating something in every in every story because he just thinks that uh, it makes him look cool and grounded. I don't know. Hmm. He's just one of the guys, you know. I guess look so. Yeah. 
I just, I just, I eat crackers off the floor like everybody else, you know? I mean, like, peak uh, Pertwee eating something is when he's eating a sandwich and doing a sword fight at the same time, so that, I don't know, that's like peak Pertwee for me. Is, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so then, as he's telling this, the, the Tower of London story, we fade out to another thing, and you think... We're going to get a flashback oh, to this man. Tower of London story. <laughs> Such a fake The way out. that it's presented, that's what it seems like. Uh, but then we, we get a van and the brigadier shows up. It's like, oh, no, it's just his stupid Trojan horse plan. I think the first um, time I've ever been disappointed to see the brigadier. Like- yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. No joke. No joke. But then he gets out and he's dressed in disguise and using an accent. And then it's like, well, all right. Yes. Yes. Got yes. yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's spectacular. It, he's oh, kind of doing like a Cockney board. dialect. Yeah. Yes. I like to think that very much like Pertwee, I think this is what Brigadier thinks a regular like citizen acts like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's so good. Um, you don't often get the brigadier in disguise. Mm-hmm. Uh, the doctor's in disguise all the time, but uh, brigadier—that's that's a whole other story. And this is this is phenomenal. Um, so yeah, so he tells them like, "Hey, we got an order for you." And the the prisoner who's running the running the place, um, which by the way, <laughs> this was the thing in the behind the scenes that I thought was funny. Uh, for all the extras, all of the all of uh, the master's men, um, all these prisoners, for the extras, they used a uh, a group of uh, military guys that like had a base nearby, or this, or they were on their base or something. So they just used them. But when they showed up to set, they were just wearing their military uniforms, and so they had to like write in a line where they're just like, "Yeah, the prisoners took over the place, and they're wearing military uniforms." That's so amazing. <laughs> Which is. <laughs> My favorite thing, uh, it's like just the most Doctor Who thing. Um, it's like just write it in the script. Who cares? <laughs> um, but anyway, so they convinces him to let him through because he's like, hey, you know, if you if uh, if you send me back without your food, I mean, that'll be pretty weird, wouldn't it? Look pretty weird. People might get suspicious. <laughs> wink, wink, <laughs> nudge, the, nudge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the guy actually falls for it and is like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Come on in. So then think? they come in. And then kick open the doors and they're like, just immediately, they pile out of the van and immediately the brigadier is like, this is our prison now. Oh, oh my it. God. He's no, my, you all answer to us. <laughs> my favorite thing about their plan is they had three guys creeping behind the van to right. like ambush the guard immediately. And like they're not like hidden at all. It's just like these three dudes just like <laughs> hanging out outside. I mean, they can't all fit in the van, Cass. I guess. Get a bigger van. They're already over budget. <laughs> I just, I, I love the idea of, like, those guys were behind the van the whole way yes, there. Just, yes. like, on skate- they, were, they were just, yeah, like, on was, skateboards, Marty like, McFly Marty McFly it, style. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Driving all the way there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so they, so they, uh, they take over, they take the prison back over, um, which is, uh, <laughs> Just I mean, I just immediately claims control. This is our prison now. Uh and and yeah, they just we get like a shootout scene um that like Nick was talking about that follows like fourth grade rules. Yeah. Of just you know, being yeah. sort of like blown back and like, okay, you're out now. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> um and then uh Mailer comes down to uh meet with the Joe and the doctor and he's like, Hey guys, guess what? You're going to be my human shields now. Uh, and <sighs> I only need, I only need one of you. So I'm going to take two. Cause if I lose one, then I'll still have the other one. Uh, and so they go and then Joe makes him fall on the stairs and then he pulls out a gun and we do a close up of the gun and it fires. And we're like, oh my god, he yes. just killed the doctor. Love this cliffhanger. Love this cliffhanger and resolution. So good. <laughs> yes. It's it is fantastic. The Mind of Evil, part six, written by Don Houghton, directed by Timothy Combe, produced by Barry Letts, script edited by Terrence Dix, air date, sixth of march, nineteen seventy one. The gunshot was actually from the brigadier who entered at just the right time and killed Mailer. Benton informs them that the master escaped and that the missile is not in the prison. 
At the warehouse, the master arrives and directs the missile at the peace conference, while Yates manages to get free and tell the brigadier where the missile is actually located. As the brigadier goes after the missile, the doctor and Joe stay behind to deal with the machine. The machine manages to use all of its reserve power to escape the coil and go on another killing spree. When the doctor and Joe find it, Burnham happens to walk by and the machine is instantly neutralized due to the presence of Burnham's simple and innocent mind. The master calls, informing the doctor of his plan to set off the missile and kickstart World War III, where he believes he will emerge as Earth's leader in the aftermath. The doctor offers the master a trade instead, the missile for a working dematerialization circuit. The master agrees to the deal, and they meet. At the warehouse, the doctor attempts to trick the master by having Burnham drop the machine near the master and run, causing the machine to begin feeding off of the master. But the master manages to knock down Burnham and escape in a police van, running Burnham over in the process and killing him. The missile is set off and the warehouse explodes as the master gets away with the dematerialization circuit. Later, the master calls the doctor to gloat, and while Joe believes that they won the day, the doctor is disappointed that the master can now come and go as he pleases while he is stuck on Earth with the Brigadier. So episode six, turns out the close-up was actually of the Brigadier's gun and he shot Hitler. Twist! <laughs> I want to know. Twist. I want to know how many times in Doctor Who they do that because I'm pretty sure in one episode of the War Games uh, when they're going to execute the Doctor, they do the close up of the gun and the fire. I know it happens at least like three other times mm-hmm. in classic Who, and it's like how many times has this specific trope been used in Doctor Who of close up of the gun, fire? Oh wait, it wasn't that gun. <laughs> I think I think much like the Daleks themselves, you were not a real doctor until one Back of your cliffhangers that's true. ends with the close up yeah. of a gun firing. Yeah. <laughs> that's your yeah. <laughs> um so uh so anyway, the machine uh it it outsmarts the coil and and busts out of there and then just starts moving around the building killing people willy nilly. Um <laughs> it it has a hunger, and it will, it it will not be stopped. It's hangry. Uh, yeah. No, I mean this machine. It's like it's like the equivalent of, of like of like Jason Voorhees just making its way through this prison, <laughs> just slaughtering dudes left and right. Um, it's uh, it's pretty great. Um, so it's making its way through. Uh, and then the doctor figures out that um, uh, Barnum's uh, goodness, his his purity, his uh, his imbecilic angelic quality, <laughs> um, neutralizes the machine anytime he's near it. He's so good and so perfect and saintly that just being near the machine. Makes the machine Cancels not hungry. It, it just loses its appetite. I, I just. <laughs> I have so many questions. As well. <laughs> That's just, like a thing in uh, in Planet of the Spiders too, right? With Tommy, the uh, the yes. in- innocent saint, yeah, and then he, he can't get zapped <laughs> by the spiders because he's so pure. He's so whatever. <laughs> That's truth in the Doctor Who universe. If you're an idiot, you're impervious. To <laughs> psychic attacks, ignorance is bliss. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah. This is where we get the look of of this of this creature that looks like a jello mold full of organs. Um, it is uh, it is horrifying to look at. <laughs> um, I because <laughs> it looks like something that would be in like a like a haunted house or something. Just like, oh, look, it's like a jar full of guts. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's horrible. There's just an eyeball. Like, yeah, it's got that there. eye. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's creepy. Super creepy. Uh, so the master reveals that his plan is if they blows up the peace committee and causes World War Three, well, naturally, he will rise as the new leader of the planet. Oh, of course. I I just I love the master's plans because there's always a huge leap of logic somewhere in the middle there. Mm-hmm. Everyone will love like, my lemonade. They'll buy it by the dozens. <laughs> just this big assumption. Yeah. 
Oh, see, no, I, I see. I, I would, I would add to that. Like, I'm going to open a lemonade stand, and everyone, and I'm going to raise the temperature of the earth so that everyone <laughs> wants is thirsty, and then I will be the only one with lemonade, and everyone will buy my lemonade, and then I will be leader of the planet, and like, then you'll respect me. <laughs> I think I, I think I just wrote a, a, a third Doctor Spec script just I then. Like it. That's, <laughs> I think that's what I just did. Um, but uh, anyway, so so uh, <laughs> um, he uh, basically the Doctor makes this uh, this deal with the Doctor. He's like, "Well, I know you need a dematerialization circuit. So if you uh, trade me." Uh, your your stuff. I'll give you that. Like if you just if you just stop what you're doing, I'll give you the dematerialization circuit, and everything will be great. Uh, and then, like it's it's just like it's literally just like this three minute sequence where all hell breaks loose. Like <laughs> like the master runs over Barnum and kills him, <laughs> and the the machine blows up in the prison and like everything blows up and then the doctor or the master gets away and Joe is crying. Like it's like three <laughs> minutes and just like everything happened. And you're like, what the episode's over. That was it. Oh my God. <laughs> like it's horrifying. Um, I have, man, they, uh, they just really rush into that ending. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy, but, uh, yeah, Barnum's dead. Um, he gets run over by the master because, Whatever. And because the, the master is up. pure evil. Pure evil. Uh, and then uh, the doctor's like, well, well, uh, Brigadier's like, well, at least he didn't get the dematerialization circuit. And the doctor's like, you're right. And then he checks his pockets. And what? Goes, well. <laughs> 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 well. Um, and then they get a phone call from the master. And he's like, ah, ha, ha, ha. I got what I wanted. Ha, enjoy your uh, exile. Bye. And then. He's he's gone, and uh, the master's or the doctor's just like, well, that sucks. Now I'm stuck here with the brigadier. And the brigadier's <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, he's like, it's like, did he did he lose? I'm 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 the loser. I'm stuck here with you. And then it's like, hey, and it ends. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So it escalates very quickly. It's like it's like a slow boil. Then all of a sudden, it's just the whole pot boils over all at once. Mm -hmm. Um. It's uh, it's pretty crazy, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I love this story so much. I really, <laughs> really do. It's so fun. Um, it's a really, really great one. If you guys, uh, if you guys uh, listen to this, uh, you know, for recaps and for um, uh, you know, just to sort of get a taste of that classic Who stuff, and you are in the mood to watch one, watch this one. It's really, really good. It's a lot of fun. Really it is, and, yeah, and it, and it just it really is like a sampler plate of everything that is that is fun about this this era of the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Jeff, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for for joining us. Oh my uh, gosh! Thanks this, for having me. Yeah, this mind of evil excursion. We'll have to have you back for another another story. Oh, I love that. Point. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so any, any closing thoughts on, uh, on this era and, uh, you have any, any requests of like the next era you'd like to guest on? Oh man, putting that to me quick. Uh, let's see. I think probably my two Baker, you were talking about next era, like Tom Baker era, not next season, like season nine, right? <laughs> Well, no, I just mean, I just mean, uh, I just mean, like, is there, is there, yeah, is there, like, another, an, what, what, which doctor, I guess, would you want to talk oh, about? Oh, gosh. I don't, it's, it's too hard to choose for me. I like <laughs> two, four, three, and seven are probably my favorite classic, uh, doctors. So, okay. It could be so many things. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, we'll definitely have to have you back on, um, uh, sooner rather than later, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, we will uh, we'll be back to talk to all of you out there, the listeners, uh, next time with um, some Fourth Doctor Scottish adventures with Zygons. Heck yes, uh, Terror Terror of the Zygons. Uh, that's uh, that's a good one, Terror of the Zygons. Which um, and I'm I'm sure I'm just going to nonstop complain about this uh, in our next in our next episode. <laughs> Uh, really, 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 really should be uh, the end of 
uh, season 12. Um, yes. The, yes. It, it has no business being the opening episode of season 13. <laughs> yes. It's the reason, it's the reason why I refuse to buy season 12 on Blu-ray as much as I want. And I'm like, it doesn't have terror. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like I just, cause it's just, oh man, it just, it just drives me nuts. Um, that it's not, it should be the end of season 12 and it's not, and it's stupid. Um, anyway, <laughs> hear me pout about that. More. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> next week when we cover that. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's what we got coming up next, and uh, we will talk to you then. Bye, everybody. Bye.